Good day, friends and viewers. In my previous uh, video, I uh, discussed about the difference between law and morality. So uh, that was uh, uh, the first part of my uh, discourse. Now, today I came with uh, the second and last part of my um, this uh, uh, topic about law and morality, the difference between law and morality. And this today I'm going to elaborate the historical development and the historical uh, uh, voyage which law and morality had taken, uh, where they became together, where they uh, separated from each other. So again, I'm going to start with the beautiful lines of the famous uh, Roman philosopher and jurist Cicero. True law is a right reason in agreement with nature. It is of universal application, unchanging and everlasting. It summons to duty by its demands and averts from wrongdoing by its prohibition. This is the beautiful line of Cicero in his book, Republic. So, ladies and gentlemen, law and morale, how they, what is their different, how you will, we can distinguish them, how can we draw a distinction line between law and morale in ancient times or in uh, Asia or in the Hindu jurist in India and other part of world, they did not make any clear distinction between law and morals. However, later on, some distinction came to, make, to be made in actual practice. The Mimamsa made a distinction between obligatory and recommendatory rules. By the time the commentaries were written, the distinction was clearly established in theory also. The commenters, commentators not only were based purely on morals, the doctrine of factum valid was recognized. That doctrine means that an act which is in contravention of some moral injunction should be considered valid if accomplished in fact. In its decision, the Privy Council made a distinction between legal and moral injunctions. The same is the case with Supreme Court and other high courts. The same was conditioned in Europe at that time in the name of doctrine of natural right. The Greek formulated a theoretical moral foundation of law. Likewise, the Roman jurist recognized in the name of natural law certain moral principle as the basis of law. During the Middle Ages, Christian morals were considered as the basis of law. After the Reformation in Europe, it was contended that law and morals are distinct or distinct and separate, and law derived its authority, not from morals, but from the state. Morals had their source in religion or conscience. During the 19th and 18th centuries, the theories of natural law had a moral foundation, and the law was linked with morals. During the 19th century, John Austin, a very renowned jurist, maintained that law had nothing to do with the morals. He defined law as the command of sovereign. Law alone is the subject matter of jurisprudence. Austin was supported by many jurists. Kelson, like, maintained that only the legal norms were the subject matter of jurisprudence. He excluded from the study of law all other considerations, including morals. There is again a new trend in modern times. The sociological approach to law indirectly studies 
moral also although a distinction is made between law and morale and law alone is considered as the proper subject matter of the study however they study other forces also include uh, including morale while tracing the origin development and functions and the flaw now i'm coming between the distinction what is the difference distinction between law and morale there is this there is a distinction between law and morale Vinogradov writes law is clearly distinguished from morality the object of law is the submission of individual to the will of organized society while the tendency of morality is to subject the individual to the doctrine of his conscience according to polak another jurist though much ground is common to both the subject matter of law and ethics is not the same the field of legal rules of conduct does not coincide with that of moral rules and it is not included in it and the purpose for which they exist are different dug it another jurist right law has its basis in social conduct moral go on intrinsic value of conduct Hence, it is vain to talk about law and morale. The legal criteria is not a, an ethical criteria. According to Patton, a very famous um, writer of jurisprudence, morals or ethics is the study of the supreme good. Law lays down what is convenient, convenient for that time and place. Ethics concentrates. on individual rather than society law is concerned with social relationship of man rather than individual excellence of their character ethics coincide consider motive as all important law insists merely by conduct with certain standard and seldom worries for motive but it is too narrow to say that ethic deals only with the individual or that ethic treats only of the interior and law only of the exterior well for ethics the judging acts must consider the consequences and uh, the consequences that flow from them moreover ethical duties of man cannot be considered without considering his obligation to his fellow uh, uh, or his place in society pound rusko pound another jurist says law and morals have a common origin but they diverge in their development bentham says a very famous philosopher in a word law has just the same center as morals but it has by no means the same circumference according to korkunov the distinction between law and morals can be formulated very simply morally furnishes the criteria for the proper evaluation of the our interest law marks out the limit within which they ought to be confined ardent writes that there are four points of uh, this difference between law and morale number 1 is in law man is considered as a person because he has a free will in morale we have to do with determining the will towards the good Number two, law consider man only in so far he lives in community with others. Moral gives a guide to lead him even if he were alone. Number three, law has to do with acts in so far as they operate externally. Moral looks to the intention of man, the inf- inner determination and direction of the will. Law governs the will. so far as may be external coercion moral seeks a free self determination towards the good 
From the above four point, uh, it follows that whereas legal rules do require external conduct and are they indifferent to motives, intention or other internal accomplishment of conduct. Moral do not require any specific external action, but only a goodwill or proper valuation, intention or motive. If a person does do something, uh, does uh, something forbidden, uh, my moral rules or for or fails to do what they require, the fact that he did not unintentionally and in spite of every case is an excuse from moral blame. A legal system or custom may have rules of strict liability under which those who have violated the rule unintentionally and without fault may be liable for punishment. Now, H.L.A. Hart, another professor of law, writes that the vague sense difference between law and morale is connected with contrast in ten internality of the one and the externality of the other. It is too recurrent a theme about law and morale to be altogether baseless and cannot be dismissed. He refers to four cardinal features which are designed uh, to distinguish morality not only from legal rule but also from other forms of social rules. Those four futures are important. Immunity from deliberate change, voluntarily character of moral offenses and form of moral pressure. Importance. As regard importance, the essential feature of any moral rule or standard as something of great significance may appear vague. It may be manifest itself in a number of ways. In a simple fact that moral standards are maintained against the drive of a strong passion, which they restrain at the rate of sacrificing, consider personal interest, and the serious form of social pressure exerted not merely to secure conformity in individual cases, but to secure that moral standards are conveyed as matter of course to all in society. In general recognition that if moral standards were generally accepted, far-reaching far and distasteful, Changes in the life of individual would occur in contrast with moral, the rules of deportment, manners, dress, and a few rules of law occupy a relatively low place in the scale of serious importance. They may be tiresome to follow, but they do not require such sacrifices. No great pressure is put to obtain conformity and no great alternation in other areas of social life would follow if they were not observed in much of importance is ascribed. So immunity from deliberate change. It is correct to say a legal system that new rules can be inserted and old ones change or repeal, but there are some rules which may be safe from deliberate change through a written constitution limiting the competence of the supreme legislature. However, moral rules cannot be brought into existence or attain, altered or done away with this way. Standard of conduct cannot be endowed with or deprived of moral status by human fiat, though day-to-day -day use of concept as enactment repeal indicate that same is not true of law. Though a moral rule or tradition is immune from repeal or change by deliberate choice or enactment, the enactment or repeal of law may well be among the causes of change or decay of some moral standard or tradition with that of change by deliberate enactment should be demarcated. <laughs> Both from immunity enjoyed by certain laws in some system through restricted clause and constitution. Law is as such immunity is removable by constitutional amendment, unlike such legal immunity from legal change. The 
capacity of morals or tradition for similar moral of change is not something which varies from community to community from time to time. It is incorporated in meaning of term. Now I am coming to the voluntary character of moral offenses. The contention that morals are connected, what is known as internal conduct, while law is connected with external conduct, is in part a mass state, misstatement of two features. If a person whose action is offended against moral rules succeeding succeed in establishing that he did that unintentionally and in spite of every precaution that was plausible for him to take, he is excused from external moral responsibility. Responsibility to blame him in this situation would be morally condemnable. Moral blame is excused because he has done all that he could do in any developed legal system. The same is true up to a point of general requirement of mens rea or guilty intention we call it. Mens rea is an element in criminal responsibility designed to secure that those who offend with carelessness unwittingly or in condition in which legal system would be open to serious moral criteria. If this were so, at any rate, it crimes carry severe punishment. Legal responsibility is not inevitably excluded by demonstrating that an excuse could not help it have kept the excuse. Moral obligation, not justification. The claim that moral do not require external conduct creates or rest on confusion of two nations. Form of moral pressure. The facts that have led to the interpretation of morality is internal as if it were the case that whenever someone was about to break a rule of conduct only, threats of physical punishment or unpleasant consequences were used in agreement to dissuade him. But it would be improbable to treat such rule as a part of morality. The typical form of legal pressure may be said to consist in such threats. Morals are concerned with the individual and lay down rules for molding of his character. Law concentrates manly on society and lays down rules concerning the relationship of individual with each other and with the state. Moral look to the intrinsic value of conduct. They take into consideration the motive Law is concerned with the conduct of individual for which it lays down standard. Moral are an end in themselves. Law is for the purpose of convenience and expediency. Its chief aim is to help, help smooth running of society. The observance of moral is a matter of individual conscience. Law brings into the picture the complete machinery of state where the individual submit himself to the will of the organized society and is bound to follow its rules. Generally, morals are considered to be of universal value, but law varies from society to society, time to time and place to place. Laws and morals differs in their application. Morals are applied after taking into consideration individual cases, whereas the application of law is uniform. Now the relationship between law and morale. A study of various legal systems makes it clear that law and morals have had a long union, long union with occasional desertion and judicial separation, but have never been completely divorced. There are indeed many different types of relations. 
between law and moral, and there is nothing that can profitably be singled out for study as the relation between them. The law of Stamler is that of jurisprudence depends much upon moral ideas as just law is need of ethical doctrine for its complete realization. Positive law and just law correspond to positive morality and rationality grounded ethics. There is no difference and if any, it is only of the difference of manner range desire of justice present itself. So another jurist actually hard is that there are many different types of relation between law and morale. There is nothing which can profitably single out for study as the relation between them. Rusko Pound, another legal jurist, he described four stages in the development of law with respect to morality. Number one is the four stages is a stage of differentiate ethical custom, custom of popular action, religion and law, analytical jurists call it a pre-legal stage in the development of law and morals were the same thing. They were the two faces of the same coin. The second stage is of the strict law, codified or crystallized, which in time is outstripped by morality and has not sufficient power of growth to keep a breach. The third stage is of a infusion of morality into a law and reshaping it by moral. In this stage, both ideas of equality and national or potential agencies of growth. The final stage is of the conscious constructive law making. The majority of law in making moral and morality are of lawmaker and law alone is for the judge. Moral is the basis of law, moral as the test of positive uh, law and moral as the end of law. So as regard uh, nature, which is mostly nature of supernatural fear, when the state came into being, it picked up those rules which were important for the point of view of society and those whose observation could be secured. The state enforced those rules and they came to be called law. Thus, law and morals have a common origin, but they came to differ in course of development. Hence, it can be said that law and morals have a common origin, but diverge in their development. On account of their common origin, many rules and common are both law and morals. Though law and morality are not the same as, as many things may be immoral, which are not illegal. Yet the absolute divorce of law from morality would result in fatal consequences. Morals are not the basis of all legal rules. They are the number of legal rules which are not based on morals. And some of them are even opposed to moral. Moral will not hold a man vicariously liable. Likewise, in cases where both the parties are blameless and they have suffered by the fraud of third party, law may impose the loss upon the party which is capable of bearing it if but that may be approved, not approved by morality. Moral as a test of law. So this view is supposed to taken, supported by Greeks and Romans. In Rome, law was to conform to national law, which is based on certain moral principles such as uh, uh, result like just civil and just gentium. Most of ancient jurists were of view that law, even if it's not in conformity with morals, was valid and binding. During the Middle Ages, the Christian father maintained that law must conform to Christian morals and any law which did not conform to them was invalid. During the 17th and 18th centuries, 
when the theory of natural law and any law which did not conform to natural law was to be disobeyed and the government which made the, that law was to be overthrown. In modern time, a law is considered to be valid and binding if it is not in conformity with morals. How were ordinary laws conformed to morals? That is largely due to the fact that there is a close relations between law and and uh, life of a community. So moral as an end of law. As regard the morals and morals have often been considered as the end of law and many eminent jurists have defined law in terms of justice which is content the aim of law is to secure justice which is very much based upon morals. In most of the language of the world, the words used for law convey the idea of justice uh, and moral also. In Sanskrit, the word for law is dharma, which also implies morals. However, the view of analytic uh, jurist is that study of the ends of law is a symbol of domain of jurisprudence. So the immediate end of law is to secure social interest, which means that the conflicting interest of the member of society should be weighted and evaluated and the interest which can bring greater benefit with the least sacrifice should be recognized and protected. Morals are an evalu evaluation of interest. According to Korkunov, the idea of value is therefore the basic concept of ethics. No other term such as duty, law, or right is final for thought. Moral as part of law. It is contended by some writer that even uh, if law and moral are distinguishable, Morality is in some way an integral part of law or of legal due. Morality is secreted in the interstices of a legal system, a legal enforcement of moral. A good deal of controversy has arisen in recent years as to whether the fact that conduct is of common standard re regarded as immoral as in itself justified that making conduct punishable by law. The view of Lord Devlin is that there is public morality which provides the cement of any human society and law. Especially criminal law must regard it it is in a primary function to maintain uh, this public morality, whether in fact in any particular case the law should be brought into play by specific criminal sanctions must depend upon the state of public feeling. Conduct which arose a widespread feeling of reprobation, a mixture of, intoler of intoleration, indignation and disgust deserve to be suppressed by legal coercion in the interest of integrity of society. The conclusion of Law of Devlin is that if a vice is not suppressed, society could crumble. To quit him, the suppression of vice is a much the same business as suppression of sub subversive activities. So G.S. Mill, another philosopher, utilitarian, uh, philosopher, it draw its arms to other according to art. Its shared morality is essential, essential to society. If any society is to survive, if any legal system is to function, then there must be rules, prohibition, for example, the murder. The rules essential for particular may also be enforced. So influence of moral on law, law and morals act and react upon each other and they mold each other in the name of justice, equity, good faith. Uh, so there is a, a moral as a restraint upon power of legislation. No legislation will dare to uh, make a law which is opposed to the morals of society. All human conduct and social relationship cannot be regulated and governed by law alone and very much relation are left to be relooked. In marriage also, as love persists, there is a little need of law to rule. The relation of husband 
and wife, but the solicitor came in through the door as love flies out of the windows. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this discourse.